As we move into the chapter 15 of the Revelation, this is the shortest chapter in all of the Revelation. Just eight verses. Very short. And yet in the midst of these eight verses, there's a tremendous pathos, a tremendous outpouring of emotion. It's not necessarily so obvious, but as you look behind what's happening here in this chapter, you will see this tremendous amount of emotion. It arouses strong feelings in us. And I can imagine as John saw these visions and as he recorded these down for us, within himself also these strong emotions arose. As I read the Revelation chapter 15, I, uh, one emotion that carries through this that I see is reminds me of W.B. Yeats's poem. And the poem is called The Second Coming. And the emotion that comes from this poem reminds me a little bit of chapter 15 of the Revelation. Part of his poem goes like this. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed. And everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. Stirs within me an emotion I see. I see suffering people. I see people who have rejected Jesus Christ and have taken the mark on the right hand or their forehead and are now suffering and will suffer for eternity for that decision that they make. And I pity them because salvation is present and available in Jesus Christ. It was for them. And yet they reject it. And that motion wells up within me that the idea that everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. That which is right is drowned out by that which is wrong. But also within the midst of chapter 15 of the Revelation, not just pity in the suffering of mankind, but I also see in the midst of chapter 15 what Mercy Me wrote about in the song that they entitled, I Can Only Imagine. The words that they wrote were these. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. And those emotions that come out of this song for me are found here in chapter 15. It swells up to a chorus of hallelujah. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. Both of these emotions are found in chapter 15. We see pity and sorrow over those who reject God. It hurts our heart to see men and women, perhaps those whom we love, perishing. And on the other side in 15, we see this, this act of worship that takes place, a pouring out of their hearts towards God and the emotions that are wrapped up in that. And after we read this, you cannot remain indifferent or emotionless after you read this chapter. You cannot be like Coach Tom Landry. He was known as an unemotional coach. He would pace the sidelines of the Dallas Cowboys for years. Walt Garrison was one of their, his running backs. He was a former Dallas Cowboy running back. He was once asked if Coach Tom Landry ever smiled. Garrison replied, I don't know. I've only played nine years with him. <laughs> you cannot remain unemotional when you see chapter 15 of the Revelation. It will stir you. God's word will take hold of our hearts and we'll see the suffering of humanity and the glory of God as he steps forward to take care of his people. Here in chapter 15 of the Revelation. If you open your Bibles with me, if you're not already there, let me read the eight verses and then we'll go back through. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside, or some translations say on, the idea is along, on, on the seashore, beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. 
And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, or ages, or saints. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Shortest chapter in the Revelation. In the midst of this chapter, it can be broken down into three areas. We see, number one, the great sign, in verse number one, the great God, in verses two through four, and then we see the great wrath that's poured out in verses five through eight. Let's look at this first, the, the great sign, in verse number one. John says, I saw another sign in heaven. Well, what's he talking about? The first one he saw, remember, was the woman that was about ready to give birth to a child in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The woman was a nation of Israel to give birth to the Messiah. That was the first sign. Now, the second sign was also in chapter 12. It was the great red dragon. And that dragon was positioning himself right before the woman. As she gave birth, he was going to devour the child. But God protects the child, draws him up to his throne. The woman is protected. Satan loses. This is now the third sign, but we are told that it is a great and amazing sign. So not just a great sign like the woman, but John stands in amazement of it. This is amazing what I'm about to see. We go on and we see that there are seven angels that have seven plagues, and these are the last. Seven is the number of completion. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. This completes. Now these are not the sum total of God's wrath. Remember, God's wrath has been displayed further earlier here in the, in the Revelation. This is then the completion of, it's bringing to the end of, it's not the sum total of His wrath. They simply complete it. They bring it to an end. They are the last before the second coming. Seven plague bowls take place after the abomination of desolation. That puts it kind of in the time frame. The reason why we know it takes place after that, remember, that's when the Antichrist stands up and says, I am God, worship me in the temple. At that point on the middle of the tribulation period, then it's past that point, probably right before the second coming. The reason why we know it's after this abomination of desolation, in verse number 2 of chapter 16 we read, So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped his name. So it's after the time the mark of the beast is initiated upon the earth. So sometime, I think, right before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, these bold judgments that we're going to see next week in chapter 16, these bold judgments, they come in a rapid fire fashion, and each one is more intense than the previous one. So they just go boom, 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 and each one gets harder and harder and harder upon humankind. Rapid fire succession. That's what opens up in verse number one of chapter 15. And then we come to uh, verses two through four, and it's almost as if it's a parenthesis, isn't it? Verses 2 through 4 don't seem to fit with this idea of the wrath of God that comes in verse number 1 and the wrath of God that comes in verses number 5 through 8. It just doesn't seem to fit in context. This is, in a sense, a parenthesis. So John starts off with the wrath of God, the seven last plagues of the wrath of God, where God's mercy is not there. And then he interjects a, little, a couple of verses that deal with God's mercy upon mankind. Here are the people who have received God's mercy. In verses 2... Through four. Let me read verse number two. Here we see the great God after we saw the great sign. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. So John says it appeared to be a sea of glass, or some translations say it's like a sea of glass. It wasn't literally a sea of glass, it was like that, it was a comparison. And the sea of glass has a, a reddened appearance as a fire was upon it. And the redeemed are standing beside or on the, on the shore of the sea of glass mingled with fire. 
Just like the Israelites did in chapter 15 of the Exodus when they went through the Red Sea and came out on the other side and God protected them, God delivered them from the, from the, from the Egyptians and the sea covered the Egyptians, they stood on the shore of the sea and gave praise to God in chapter 15 of Exodus. Just like that we see right here. Fire we have seen in the past speaks of a judgment that's upon it. And the sea is red aglow with God's wrath that's going to be poured out upon unredeemed humanity. You could almost say it like this. Their exodus from spiritual Egypt, which is Jerusalem, according to chapter 11, verse 8, has led them through the Red Sea of martyrdom, which is now exchanged for the crystal sea of heaven. I like that. We are told here in the text that those who had conquered the beast. Now, this is the first question I asked myself when I read that. And you may have asked yourself when I read it through the first time or even the second time. Those who had conquered the beast. Wait a second. These are those who have been killed for their faith. These are the ones who gave the ultimate witness to the reality of Jesus Christ by giving their own blood. And they died. How could one say they conquered the beast? It seems as if the beast had conquered them. He killed them. How could you say they conquered the beast? In what way did they conquer the beast? That's the questions that came into my mind. How were they conquerors? Well, that takes us back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. This is how they conquered. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. How did they conquer the world system? How did they conquer the beast? By faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, they were killed for their faith. Yes, they suffered for their faith. But now they stand in heaven before a holy God, vindicated as being the people of God. They conquered. And the beast is going to lose. That way, in that sense, they conquered. Now, the grammar of the sentence emphasizes their character more than the event of the victory. So they have this character of being conquerors. That's who they are. Not the event of conquering, but their character is what the grammar of the sentence talks about. Verses 3 and 4 were introduced to a song or something that they're singing now. Verses 3 and 4. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now the construction of this the sentence number three, verse number three, this construction of the text tells us that there are two songs in play here. Not one song, but two songs. It's the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. The word song is used twice in the text, so it tells us it's two separate songs. So there are two songs. Now you ask, what's the song of Moses? Well, there are two possibilities. I told you once, uh, I'll tell you already, that Exodus 15 describes the victory, the deliverance of the nation of Israel. And as they're on the Red Sea, on the bank of the Red Sea, as the water has covered over the Egyptians, they're standing on the bank of the Red Sea, and they sing what's called the Song of Moses, Exodus chapter 15. It goes something like this. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. It's called the Song of Moses. There's another one at the end of Moses' life that's also called the Song of Moses. It comes in the end of, end of the book of Deuteronomy. And also it's called the Song of Moses. And Moses spoke the words of this song until they were finished in the ears of all the assembly of Israel. It also is the Song of Moses. And it deals with things like God's faithfulness, the history of the nation of Israel, Israel's rejection of God, God's judgment on those who forsake him, God's vindication of his people are all wrapped up in Deuteronomy chapter 32. So the question is, which one is it? Which is the song of Moses? Well, we're also told it's the song of the Lamb here. Now, we really don't have any direct reference to exactly what the Song of the Lamb is. Nowhere are you going to read, this is the Song of the Lamb, and then follows as the text. You're not going to find that anywhere in the Bible. So we really don't have a direct reference of what exactly the Song of the Lamb is. The 24 elders and the four living creatures, they sang a new song before the Lamb. It doesn't say that it was the Song of the Lamb. They sang it before the Lamb. That's Revelation chapter 5. Jesus said he had overcome the world and is alive forevermore, having the keys of death and Hades. I guess if we were to say what was the, the content of the Song of the Lamb, it could be this. The Song of the Lamb is about Christ's redemption of sinners through the sacrifice of the cross. 
So we see judgment of sin and deliverance of sinners. And to tie those two together, we see that the Song of Moses deals with deliverance. The nation of Israel was delivered. Also that God vindicates His people and watches over His people in the Song of Moses. And here we see the deliverance of sinners here in the Song of the Lamb. If you blend those two together, that's probably what this song is all about. But what you'll notice when I read it, there are no references to Exodus 15 in this text, verses 3 and 4. There are no references to Deuteronomy 32. There's no references to Jesus or the cross or the resurrection or His sacrifice on the cross. It's not here in the text. Instead, it's a conglomeration of a bunch of Old Testament passages all put together. And they sing this text, and they sing the song of Moses, servant of God and the song of the Lamb. They blend it all together. So you could say that these two songs celebrate two great redemptive acts, the deliverance of Israel and the deliverance of sinners by God from sin through Christ, and they form a unique harmony that has not been seen before. It is a wonderful song. It's a song of deliverance. It's a song that God sticks up for His people. It's a song that God says, you are mine and I will watch over you. I will restore when you, when you fall away. I will deliver you from the presence of sin someday in my presence in heaven. It is a song of God's vindication of His people. Deliverance. The song focuses completely on God. Not on the people who have been martyred. Not even on the Israelites in Exodus 15. Not about the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ. It focuses directly on God and God Himself. You could say this. This song, since it didn't talk about the, the martyrs suffering, didn't talk about the trials that they underwent having to live under the Antichrist, doesn't allude to any of those things. It simply alludes to God's faithfulness and that God is just in all of His ways. That's the theme of this song. So this song, you could say, has an above-the-sun point of view. Let me see if I can explain that phrase to you. Above-the-sun point of view. I'm sure it's not new with me. I'm sure someone else has said it before. It takes us back to the book of Ecclesiastes, where the writer of Ecclesiastes says often, under the sun, under the sun, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity under the sun. If you live for under the sun, life is vanity, is what he's saying. So when he gets to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, what he's trying to teach his son is live above the sun. Focus in on God and God's faithfulness and that God's ways are just, even though life may not play out like you planned it. That's living above the sun. That's the attitude of Romans 8. All things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. That's the theme of Romans 8. That's living above the sun. We don't get wrapped up in all the things that are going around around us. Evil circumstances, sicknesses that come into our life, the death of a loved one, all those things that hurt and cause us to suffer. The focus is not there. The focus is above the sun to God in His faithfulness. And all His ways are just and right. That's living above the sun. That's what this song is all about. It's living above the sun. Now, let's look at verses 5 through 8. So we swing from... Wrath of God, verse number one. Then we move into this emotion of worship and praise, verses two through four. So one side, God, John sees this wrath that's going to be poured out, and he hurts for those on the earth that have rejected God. And then he moves right into this praise and worship time. And I heard someone say before we started singing, I'm tingling all over. I can't even feel my fingers when we talked about God healing somebody. I'm excited. That's what John, I'm sure, felt as he saw this worship going on in heaven. All these redeemed standing before the Lord. Even suffering redeemed. Now we move back into this idea of God's wrath that's seen again in verses 5 through 8. And so John is, I can imagine he's an emotional wreck swinging back and forth, pendulum from side to side. Look at 5 through 7. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure bright, bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So John's attention is now diverted to a new vision. He sees and he turns and he sees the, the tabernacle in heaven. He sees this heavenly tabernacle. The tent of witness comes in his view. 
Now, we know that the earthly tent of witness was made after the tent of witness in heaven. So this is then the true tent of witness, and what Moses made was just a copy of that. Now, this tent of witness, this tent of sanctuary was open, and John could see into it. It wasn't that it was closed. There was, a, there was a tent that went all the way around the outside of the tabernacle. For those standing outside could not see in in the Old Testament. Now John says it's open and he could see into that. It was open that he could see the, the holy place and the most holy place. And then he sees seven angels coming out of the sanctuary, the tent of witness. Now I don't know if they came out side by side, seven abreast like this, and then went out of the temple area. I'm not sure. Or I'm not sure if they went out one by one single file and John said, one angel, two angel, three angel, four angel, five angel, six angels, seven. I don't know. I don't know if they came out like this or they came out single file. But you can imagine the impact it would have on John if these angels came out one at a time. With the expression that's on their face and the clothing that they're wearing, John got a picture of what's going to happen here. For you see that they had this, this, this clothing that was called pure and bright linen. And they had these golden sashes. And I don't know if it went like this around the chest or if it went like this around the chest, like a, like a, a, a toga or something. I don't know exactly how it went. It just says it was golden sashes around the chest. What probably John remarked on when he saw these angels with the, golden, with the, with the bright linen, the first thing John thought about was Old Testament priests. The Old Testament priests wore linen garments when they ministered into the temple or in the tabernacle. And so these angels are coming out wearing these pure, bright linen garments with golden sashes around them, almost in a priestly function they're coming out. And in a sense, that's exactly what they're doing. These seven angels come as priests because they come for the sacrificing of a great sacrifice to the offended holiness and justice of God. One of the four living creatures gives them these bowls. Now, these bowls aren't deep. Now, if you go over to Chan's restaurant, he serves this egg flour soup or some sort of noodle soup. And I'm not kidding. The bowl is this big. It's huge. I looked at it one time. I said, how can you possibly eat all that? I mean, it's just gigantic. A huge bowl like that would take time to pour out. These are not bowls like that. These are very shallow bowls like this. So the pouring out is quickly. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 16. These, these bowl plagues are poured out one right after the other quickly. They don't come in little increments. They don't come slowly. They come fast and hard in rapid fire succession. So these bowls are very shallow bowls. We see that the bowl judgments are very similar to the trumpet judgments. They handle four parts of creation, land, sea, fresh water, and sky. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is that the trumpet judgments normally affected only one-third of the total. In other words, one-third was affected, but two-thirds experienced God's mercy. One-third affected, two-thirds God's mercy. But here with the bowl judgment, they don't affect one-third of mankind. It affects the whole. Once again, reminding us God's mercy is over. There is no more mercy to be given to mankind. It has come to an end. The time of God's mercy has passed. So these bold judgments affect the whole. Look at verse number 8. What happens? And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So just like when Moses consecrated the tabernacle, this cloud fell down upon the tabernacle, and no one could enter into it. On Mount Sinai, when God came down upon the mountain, he was clothed with smoke, said the presence of God was there. When Solomon dedicated the temple in Jerusalem, after he dedicated and consecrated the temple, a cloud came down and covered the whole temple area, and no priest could go into it. No one. And none of these seven angels could go back in. They couldn't say, whoops, I forgot something inside. I need to go back in. No one, we're told in the text, could go back in. It was restricted. And the smoke that we see here and the cloud and we see in the Old Testament speak about the presence of God. God's presence is here. Now, God is spirit, and we know that he is everywhere present at once. We understand that. But his manifest presence now here is in the sanctuary in heaven, in the tabernacle in heaven. It's filled, and no one can go in. The manifest presence of God is right there. Do you remember what's in the most holy place in the tabernacle or the temple? Do you remember what's there? When you enter into the most holy place, you pass by 
pieces of furniture, talked about in the Old Testament. And you get into the most holy place, and in this most holy place are two pieces of furniture. One, they combine one unit. There are two separate pieces of furniture. It's the Ark of the Covenant, where the Ten Commandments are kept, Aaron's rod that budded, and a pot of manna. And on top of that, it's the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was a place where the high priest just once a year took blood from a sacrificed animal, went in and sprinkled it on the mercy seat, and the nation of Israel was covered for an entire year. It's where God met with his people and met with mercy on the mercy seat. Now we are told no one can go into the temple. The mercy seat now is inaccessible. There is no more mercy. As we saw last week, it's over. Mercy is gone. The time of God's wrath and judgment has come. You know, honestly, it's hard for us to reconcile the love of God displayed in Jesus Christ and the wrath of God displayed here. That's hard for us, isn't it? We see Jesus Christ in all of his beauty, and he was beautiful. He was stern, yes. He stood up for God. He was a man. He stood up and he spoke up for God. And yet we see God's love and compassion on the cross for us who needed a Savior. So we see in Jesus Christ the love of God. But here we see the wrath of God. And it's hard for us to bring the two together. How could God love and yet pour out his wrath on mankind? That's hard for us to understand. We know some things about God. We know, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 33, this is what God said about himself. As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Listen to me. God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I do not wait in heaven waiting to crush the wicked. I have no pleasure in their death. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways is what God calls out. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So for God to sit in his tabernacle and his temple in heaven and look down and say, oh, I just can't wait for this day. That's not the heart of God. The heart of God is full of mercy and compassion and love, and yet at this point in time, it is no longer available for man on the earth. They had an opportunity. The witnesses, the two witnesses, talked about Jesus Christ. The 144,000 preached Jesus all over the world. They had an opportunity to believe, to follow God, and they chose not to, but to follow the beast and the image of the beast. And God's mercy is at its end. But God still takes no delight in the death of the wicked. 2 Peter 3.9, he says this. Peter says about the Lord, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That is the heart of God. God's Father heart says, I wish you would turn from your wicked ways and believe Jesus Christ for salvation, that you would come into a relationship with me, not a religion, but know me personally. Be saved, be born again, all those terms you want to apply to that. That's my desire. I don't desire the death of the wicked. I have no pleasure in that. So we see in a sense God moving into his heavenly tabernacle, and in a sense his silence is there. As the Father heart of God breaks because the justice and the holiness of God must act and the mercy and love of God is at its end. His heart breaks. Now, not to read in too much to the text, nor far be it from me to know the mind of God, but knowing his character, knowing what his desires are, I cannot imagine the Father sitting in heaven saying, all right, I've been waiting for this day to happen. His heart's breaking over those on the earth where his mercy is no longer available for them. We see the Father heart of God displayed here. And the sanctuary through all of chapter 16 till we get to verse number 17, the sanctuary in heaven is silent. No voices, no lightnings, no thunders. Nothing comes out of the sanctuary. God has come into the sanctuary, filled it with his presence, and it's silent as all these bowls are poured out upon mankind. And it's horrific. The suffering is tremendous. And the Father heart of God, as it were, breaks in his heavenly tabernacle. Then we come to verse number 17 of chapter 16. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple. The silence is now broken. It comes from the throne, saying, It is done. 
I've had to act in justice and righteousness against my own creation because they rebelled against me. And the Father heart of God says, I wish that they would have turned from their wicked ways and lived. My desire was life, and they chose death. He said, it's done. I can set up my kingdom upon this earth. I can come down and be with my people. There will be no more sun or light because the God and the Lamb are the light. There's no more temple because God is present with his people. No more crying, no more tears, no more suffering. God now can set up his kingdom upon this earth. It's done. And now I'll be with my people. I wish the others would have been with me too, but they chose not to. Some things we need to remember from this text. First thing is this. In the midst of this world, when Satan throws everything he can against you, like these people here, he actually killed them. When Satan in the world throws everything against you, and you are suffering, you are suffering perhaps with a sickness, you are suffering perhaps with evil circumstances that you did not cause, in the midst of this trial and this suffering, there's something that we need to understand and never forget, and it's this. God is for us. When it seems the hand of God is moving against the Father, why are you doing this, God? Why am I suffering? Why am I going through this trial? Why does my loved one have to get sick? We come back with a statement, God is for us. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Let me just read. It's going to pop up here on the screen. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, Who can be against us? Not Satan, not the world, not even my own family. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In the midst of your suffering, remember, God is with you. He will vindicate his people and show that your faithfulness and your obedience will not be ignored or forgotten. And he will raise you up to his presence someday. And you can do this. Hold me, Papa. Hold me, Papa. Because God's for you. Second thing to remember is this. We need to have an over or above the sun point of view to life. Do not get wrapped up in the circumstances you find yourself right now in and ask, why God, why, 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 why? Now, I need to say this. I am not opposed to asking God why you're going through a circumstance or a trial. I'm not opposed to that. And I don't think it's wrong because we see it in the Old Testament often, especially Psalm 13, which I heard last Wednesday night about that. We see David asking why. For example, he says, Will you forget me forever? How long, O Lord? How long will you hide your face from me? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there and cried out, How long, God? I don't understand. Why? Why is this happening to me? He goes on further and he says, How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? He was asking why. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with asking why are you going through these things in your life as long as you don't forget the above the sun point of view to life. And that is all things work together for good to those who love God who are called according to his purposes. They saw above the sun, not under the sun. And if we remember God is just and holy in all of his ways, whatever's going on in my life around me, I can trust God and have faith in him. That's an above the sun point of view. Not a woe is me, pity me in my life point of view. And the last one is this. Last one is this. Tell others about God's saving mercy today. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't delight when an unbeliever dies and enters into an eternity without him in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. He has no delight in that. He rejoices when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ. The angels rejoice in heaven when one sinner comes to repentance. Tell others today about God's saving mercy before they end up here in chapter 15 where God's mercy has gone. It's not there anymore. And God's wrath only is to be seen. Tell them today. Today is the day of salvation. You may be sitting here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's about knowing a person, Jesus Christ. It's not about coming to a church building or being baptized or being a church member. It's about knowing Jesus personally. You may not know Jesus personally today. I want to tell you, God's mercy is great. He's full of forgiveness and compassion. 
If you will turn from your ways to him, he will forgive you. He will, he will make you his son or daughter, and you will live with him forever. You will be born again. That's God's mercy. So tell others about God's saving mercy today while it is yet day. Will the worship team come up now to continue on with the rest of our service, please? Several hundred years before the birth of Jesus, there was a crucial battle that took place between the Greeks and the Persians. It took place upon the plains of Marathon. The battle raged for hours. Both sides, it didn't seem that, that anyone was getting the upper hand. In many respects, it was a fight to the finish. The Greeks knew that if the Persians conquered them, that would be it. Civilization, as they knew, would be over and the Persians would rule over them. Persians thought the same thing about the Greeks. It was a fight to the finish. Finally, the numerically inferior Greeks got the upper hand, the underdogs. They, man they managed a tremendous tactical move. But there was a problem. They had won the battle, but they realized soon the Senate that was in Athens, miles away, was to vote and would most certainly ratify a treaty of appeasement with the Persians. They would say, okay, we are, we're appeased with you, and yet they won the victory at Marathon. In desperation, they sent a runner in full battle gear to go the 27 miles to tell of the news. By the time the young boy got to Athens, he had run a marathon. It is said he was totally spent, that he literally ran himself to death. He came in, he delivered the message, and the message was one word. After he delivered the one word message, he fell over dead. He literally ran himself to death. And when he came in with the one word message, this is what he said, victory, and he died. And the message that we speak today is this, Christ has won the victory. You can be forgiven and restored to God, reconciled to him, live forever and experience worship and praise in his presence forever and ever. The word is victory. Have you learned Christ's victory? Do you have Christ's victory? Are you saved today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the message here. I can imagine John's emotions were all over the place, as mine was when I read it. And yet in the midst of this, in the midst of this, we see your mercy is displayed in those who stood before the sea, who conquered the beast and his image because they had the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. That's who they were. That was their character. And they won a victory over the beast, even though he literally killed them for their faith. They still won. Father, I pray for us that get wrapped up in our everyday experiences and live so many of our days under the sun. You have something better for us. You want us to live above the sun, to trust you, Walk in obedience, walk in your spirit, and be faithful in all things, realizing all things work together for good. Everything. Help me, Father, to have that perspective.